What is truth? What is the truth? The truth is that as Pilate observes, it is Jesus' own people, his own nation, and his own chief priests who have handed him over to the Romans. The truth is that the head of the religious institution are the ones who say with one voice, we have no king but Caesar. In clear contradiction of millennia of religious doctrine that says that God is their king. That their job as the priests is to mediate between God and God's people. The truth is that the problem isn't just with the Judeans in this story, but with all of us. Because when it suits us, we are all ready to follow the person with the biggest stick, the strongman savior who can make America great again, or who can help us build back better. The truth is that in order to, get what we, to keep what we have and to get what we want, we'll take just about any bargain we can get. That's what the chief priests did. It's clear from this story that they want something from Caesar. Because they could have done, as Pilate suggested, they could have did to Jesus what they did to Stephen in the book of Acts. They could have stoned him to death under their own blasphemy laws. But if they did that, Caesar wouldn't know about it, would he? Wouldn't know that they were loyal. No, they needed Caesar to know that they were firmly in his corner. Why? Maybe because they were afraid of him? Maybe because, as the high priest himself said, if Rome didn't see them act definitively to reject this Jesus character, the whole nation could perish. And so it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that that's exactly what happened? With the benefit of hindsight, hindsight which St. John the Evangelist also had, we know that Rome did eventually sack Jerusalem and raise the temple. The priests' attempt to pacify Caesar by handing Jesus over didn't work. And that's because the truth is that Caesar is not the one who's in control here. Pilate, who's Caesar's proxy in this story, finds no fault with Jesus. He wants to let Jesus go. But of course, we know that's not what happens. At one point, Pilate says to Jesus, Don't you know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? It's cute that he thinks that. But the truth is that he doesn't. He's not in control of this situation. Because the truth is that all of the institutions in this story that we create to keep ourselves safe and happy and prosperous, all the systems we put in place to protect the peace and maintain order, they all fail catastrophically by doing exactly what they were designed to do. The religious institution condemns Jesus for blasphemy. The local Roman governor crucifies a rebel. The people proclaim their loyalty to their leaders. It all happens exactly as it's supposed to. Which forces me to ask a question today. Why Christ the King? When it seems that it's the very idea of kingship and worldly power and authority that seem to have driven this story off the rails, why on this day do we call Jesus by that title? As I mentioned earlier, Pope Pius XI instituted the feast in 1925. If you remember what was happening then, that was the aftermath of the First World War. That war and the, le the years leading up to it saw the decline and fall of multiple ro uh, royal dynasties across Europe. The Hohenzollerns, the Romanovs, the Habsburgs. The Ottomans didn't just lose their dynasty, but also the entire empire over which they ruled. As these empires were falling, secularism was rising in the West, and totalitarianism was taking hold in Russia and Italy, as it soon would in Germany. In the midst of all of this, Pius established this feast as a reminder of Christ the King, of whose kingdom there will be no end. My first thought in reading this is that the Pope wanted to offer comfort and hope to a people 
whose world was being shaken. But I also kind of have to wonder. I have to wonder because for several decades prior, another thing that was happening was that the Vatican and the Kingdom of Italy had been in a dispute over whether the Pope or the King controlled the government of Rome and therefore the nation. Not four years after this feast was instituted, Pius signed an agreement with one Benito Mussolini in which the church ceded what little control they had left over Rome and the papal states to the nation of Italy, maintaining only Vatican City as a sovereign state. So the Pope is losing power. He sees the people across the continent and across the world turning away from God to follow secular ideals or strong charismatic dictators. And so I have to wonder, was Pius' intent in establishing this feast pastoral, to give comfort and hope? Or was it imperative to remind people who was in charge and whom he represented? Was he maybe also trying just a little bit to hang on to his own power? To be honest, I find it kind of off-putting to use language of kingship and royalty and dominion to talk about God so uncritically in the church. The truth is that we all generally agree that having too much power, political or otherwise, concentrated in one place is not a good thing. And yet we acclaim Christ King and Lord and pray for him to rule and to teach us to obey. For some reason, we still want to imagine that God is just the Caesariest Caesar, right? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But what does that mean when the concept of King and Lord and Caesar is fundamentally flawed? I have to wonder if this feast And these stories we read today invite us to consider an alternative. When St. John the Seer wrote his book of Revelation, he recognized this. Throughout the text of his masterpiece work of apocalyptic fantasy, he plays with this theme of victory and conquest. Rome, as everybody knew, conquered by force. They enforced the peace at the point of a sword. And it worked, but it had a cost. Because anyone who is deemed an enemy of the state, and that anyone included Jesus, was sacrificed to the machine for the good of the order, for the preservation of the peace. And so John weaves together images of God's conquest and victory, but always with a twist. Jesus conquers with a sword, but instead of holding that sword in his hand, it comes from his mouth. John portrays him as the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is also an itty-bitty lamb, slaughtered and yet living. In this, his introduction to the book which we read today, he sets up his thesis by introducing Jesus first and foremost, not as conqueror or victor, but as faithful witness to the truth. What is truth? The truth is that in the midst of all of this comedy of errors in which the chief priests publicly commit blasphemy and the will of the Roman governor is conquered by the crowd, There is one person in this whole story who is utterly in control, and it's the one who's about to die. For this I was born, he says, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. By standing there and watching the pandemonium unfold, he is testifying to the truth. The truth that he's the only one in this story who's doing exactly what he came to do. Because, of course, the truth is Jesus himself. Pilate and the priests represent the kind of power we want to have. The power to destroy our enemies, to overcome our challenges, to guarantee our safety and our prosperity and our success. Coercive power, 
like the power that Rome yields, wields, is the power that seduces the religious leaders. That power demands that we submit to some king in order to gain what we want, a Faustian bargain to remain in control. It assumes that there is an inherent hierarchy in nature and that the best place to be is at the top. And so that's where God must be. For centuries, the church believed this lie. Just as kings have dominion over commoners, so men should have dominion over women and civilized people over savages and the pure white race over the defiled, darker-skinned races. This myth is the source and the legacy of colonial power. And to use that power to maintain the control that we have is to admit, to proclaim with full-throated assent that we have no king but Caesar. It is to hand over our humanity to be sacrificed to the machine. The truth, it seems, is that hierarchy and power maybe are what kill us rather than what save us. But Jesus, on the other hand, doesn't play by that game. He doesn't order his servants to, keep, to fight from keep him from being hand go, handed over. Instead, he persistently testifies to that truth, even when it costs him his life. The truth that our hope does not lie in conquering our enemies. The power of Rome is to subjugate and civilize the heathens, to kill the savage and save the man. That's how we've been taught that salvation works. But Jesus testifies to the truth. The truth that to be fully human is not to rule over others, but to love them. To bear patient witness to the truth of God revealed in Christ, not in Caesar. This truth exposes all the lies that we tell ourselves about what we need to survive and thrive. Jesus eschews all power. He's denied everything that we always strive for. He even has his life stripped from him, and yet he is the victor in this story. He's slaughtered, and yet victorious, killed, and yet alive. Maybe the truth is that we don't need kings and power and all, those, all that those things promise us. I wonder if this day invites us to ponder what other lies we tell ourselves, what other passions that hold us captive. What do you believe that will make you safe or happy or successful? What are you chasing after? Is it a lifestyle? Is it projecting a particular image, losing weight, attaining some sort of success? What could this mean for the church? What if the power and the privilege that the church has enjoyed over the last two millennia has been as much a curse as a blessing? As religious adherence declines and congregations shrink, what if the way of Jesus isn't backward trying to reclaim what was, but forward in leaving those things behind? What if that's what it means to proclaim Christ as our King? Could it be that perhaps our salvation lies in letting go of Constantine's hand and turning instead to the one who leads us to the cross? Maybe the truth we celebrate today is not that Christ is our king, but that because he is not, he offers us what kings cannot. Maybe the question we're invited to ponder is whether God wants to be our king or our God. How are those things different?